I guess I will give uh, the stage to uh, Tanisa so she can run the event and Great. Uh, keep listening. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, so good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you guys to our third RCT Human Capital Seminar Series. Um, today, the series is a little earlier than usual to um, accommodate the time difference with our speaker from Mexico, Professor Mauricio Romero from U uh, Instituto Tecnologico Autonomo de Mexico, or ITAM. So the RCT Human Capital Seminar Series is jointly hosted by Pierre, uh, Boyden Parkon Institute for Economics Research, and RIPEC, the Research Institute for Policy Evaluation and Design, and EEF, the Equitable Education Fund. So today, Professor Romero will present his work, Beyond Short-Term Learning Gains, the Impact of Outsourcing Schools in Liberia After Three Years. Um, which is a joint work with Justin Sandifer. So before we start today, I would like to um, briefly introduce our speaker. Professor Romero currently is an assistant professor of economics at Instituto Tecnologico Autonomo de Mexico, ITAM. Sorry if I pronounce that wrong. Um, so um, Professor Romero has earned a BA in economics and a BA in mathematics from Universidad de Los Andes, and he completed his PhD in economics at the University of California, San Diego. Professor Romero also has affiliations at the Jamil Poverty Action Lab, or JPAL, and Innovations for Poverty Action, or IPA, and also at Experiments in Governance and Politics, or EGAP. So his work focuses on the bottlenecks that impede high quality government creation of education, healthcare, and environmental protection. And in conjunction with his critical research agenda, he works on methodological issues in applied econometrics and statistics. And um, for today's seminar, we will have until 9.30. Um, questions are also encouraged and welcome along the presentation. Um, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Professor Romero. Thank you very much, Tanisa, for the introduction. So, um, as you just said, I'm going to present work uh, about outsourcing schools in Liberia. Uh, and this is joint work with uh, Justin Sandefer, who works at the Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C. And this paper really is a follow-up from uh, another paper that I had with Justin and a uh, grad student at UC San Diego, uh, Wayne, and that's why it's called Beyond the Short-Term Learning Gains. So just to give you a preview of what happened in the previous paper is uh, we did like a short-term evaluation of this outsourcing program and we found some short-term learning gains. And now we're going to explore what happened after one year of the program. Um, feel free to ask questions along the way. Uh, and if for some reason my connection gets if you're something, just let me know and I can pause or I can repeat myself. Happy to do that. So um, this is the plan for today. I'll do a brief introduction, then I'll tell you how the experiment was designed, and then I'll tell you about the uh, results. That's where we will spend the bulk of the time in learning, access to schooling, sustainability, and safety. Um, and then we'll just have like a brief conclusion at the end. This is really a paper where there's usually uh, a lot of controversy. <laughs> so feel free to, you know, stop at any time, ask questions that you think might be uncomfortable and we'll, we'll uh, you know, kind of dig them right head on. So um, what is this paper about? This paper is about a public private partnership in education and these public private partnerships the logic behind them is that they are meant to overcome an efficiency equity to trade off. So on the efficiency side, there's some evidence in some sectors and in some countries and in some periods of time that the private sector is better managed than the public sector and it tends to be more 
uh, efficient or productive. And private schools are not the exception. There's some evidence that private schools are on average better managed than public schools, or at least that they are as good, but they tend to be cheaper. So they are better value for the money. The problem is that if you kind of let the private sector take charge of, uh, of the education system, then you have equity concerns as only the better off parents or the richer households are able to uh, afford the better schools. So uh, there's evidence of this that, you know, fee charging private schools make use inequality and induce sorting across neighborhoods and across schools. And this might worsen the education outcomes for the lower uh, socioeconomic households. And as we tend to think that, you know, education is kind of this vehicle for social mobility, obviously you worry that it's going to have intergenerational consequences. Um, there's a second reason why you do public private partnerships and is to overcome financing constraints. So in many cases, governments just don't have the budget to build a road or build schools or even run schools. And big donors, say the World Bank or big investors like the IFC might not be willing to give money to a certain government because they honestly just don't trust them to run very, school, very well whatever project is that they have in mind. So uh, by entering these public-private partnerships, government kind of governments kind of hope to raise capital to run whatever project they want, and this is going to be the case in education as well. Uh, and obviously, this means that any impact that we're going to look like is going to be a mix of whatever capital they're able to raise and whatever uh, efficiency gains or losses there are from uh, outsourcing the management of the project to the private sector. Um, Obviously, not everything is good uh, in the land of uh, public private partnerships, PPPs. Why? Because these private contractors are going to have incentives or might have incentives to cut quality on anything that is non-contractor or non-monitor. Um, and there's also a multitasking product. So if you write a contract that incentivizes them to do well in, say, a learning metric in the case of schooling, they might do really bad in some other metric like, um, I don't know, like civic duty or safety or access or something else. So there are all these reasons why, you know, on the one side, public private partnerships look great on paper, but there might be downsides, which essentially this multitasking problem and uh, the non-contracted outcomes. So what was this project about? So this project was at the time when it uh, rolled out a few years ago, yeah. it was very controversial and it was all over the mm -hmm. news. So the yeah, Financial Times yeah. kind of had this article saying, yeah, you know, it's like you're outsourcing yeah. education, yeah. is it going to work? Um, yeah. well, that was so is there a question like or I think just yeah. some okay. background noise maybe? Okay. Um, so the Financial Times had uh, this article, the economists, you know, also call it a bold experiment in school reform to try to uh, improve outcomes. Then the New York Times had this article saying, you know, Liberia desperate to educate turns to charter schools. Charter schools are the equivalent of a public private partnership in the U.S. for education. Uh, and then Box even said that Liberia was outsourcing all its primary schools to a startup backed by Mark Zuckerberg. Um, kind of trying to add a little bit of, to the drama here. So all that uh, is a little bit of, you know, there's some truth to all that, but there's also a lot of inaccuracies in all these articles. So let me just explain in a few words what the program was about. Uh, and the program was originally called Partnership Schools for Liberia. So we're going to call them Partnership Schools. Later, when the government changed, they rebranded the program to LEAP the Liberia Education Advancement Program, but really it's just the same thing on a different label. So the program is going to consist of 93 schools that are going to be free for parents uh, and for children. They are going to be non-selective, meaning that uh, the, whoever's running the schools cannot select who they enroll, uh, what children they take up into their school. They are going to be staffed by teachers on the government payroll. So the teacher, the head teacher, and everyone else who works in the school is going to be on the government payroll. And here's the big important difference. They are going to be managed by eight private contractors. So this is where the outsourcing comes. So the private part in this public-private partnership is going to be the management of the school. The management loosely defined as whatever you do on a daily basis to manage your school. 
uh, and that's sort of how it was written in the contract. So there's not a lot of details of like, you know, what you need to take charge is like this and that. It's really, you manage the school and try to do as well as you can with this school. The school, you need to take the teachers from the government payroll. You need to, they need to be free and they need to be done selected. In exchange for managing these schools, these contractors are going to get a $50 uh, per student subsidy or payment, and they can fundraise as much money as they want for this project if they're able to. Uh, yes, T. Hi, hey, uh, Boris. Um, I mean, one thing when I read the paper, I was wondering, I mean, the principal is a government official. Yeah. Uh, okay, now, how... <laughs> How do management go with, with this principle? I mean, can, can you tell a little bit more of a story about that? Yeah, so, I mean, I can tell you a little bit what I think happens in the practice, and then I have a little bit of data. But uh, what I think happens in the practice is these contractors kind of go into the schools and impose, in a sense, like a method of teaching. So the method varies contractor by contractor. So some contractors kind of have tablets that they give to the teachers that have lessons plans that are very detailed. So the lesson plans kind of go like, you know, you entered, like the little, I have seen them. They, they will say something like, you enter the classroom and say hi to the children. So you read that and you're like, hi children. And then step two, like, tell the children that today they are going to learn how to act. So it's like, okay, so today you're going to learn. And then the teacher just kind of reads off this very detailed lesson plan. And the logic here is like someone very smart designed the lesson plan somewhere. And this lesson plan is the best lesson plan in the universe and it's going to work very well in a school in Liberia. Question mark about whether that's true or not, but that's the logic. In other cases, uh, there'll be something, you know, more low tech. So it'll be like just going to and giving the teachers kind of like quick refresher trainings or like pedagogic trainings on like how to improve their teaching abilities. In other cases, it'll be like, shifting the school schedule around. So it'd be like, oh, maybe we should do math in the morning and, you know, English in the afternoon, just kids are better at math in the morning. Maybe. Um, and in many cases, the management really was someone on a motorcycle from one of these private companies going around the schools, just making sure that kind of the teachers were there, the principal was there, and the teachers were in the, uh, I'm sorry, and the students were in the classroom actually being taught something. So it was a little bit of like, upper level or oversight of just kind of making sure that the schools were doing what they were supposed to do. Um, I, so don't, don't you, I mean, don't you have a resistance from the, uh, the pr principles? And because somehow I think you cannot fire the principal, right? You cannot ask. That's absolutely answer. right. So, so I, I the, we'll see it in the data. So originally the first year, I think there was a lot of kind of, you know, it was a new program. Everyone is always kind of excited by new things happening in their schools. And there was a lot of behavior change from teachers and the principals. So like, they were more likely to show up. They were more likely to do a bunch of things. And, and I think eventually they figure out, wait, these people cannot really fire me. And they are not really paying me extra money either. So my, you know, my incentives have, haven't really changed. And you know, that doesn't, that's not true for everyone. Some people have a lot of interest in motivation and then they'll, you know, do more stuff. But I think for a lot of teachers, it was like, hmm, incentives haven't, haven't changed. And then they went back to the status quo. And that's why the results after the first year would be a little bit disappointing. Uh, just to give you a preview. Oh, thanks. Come up. <clears throat> yeah. uh, ne Nana? Is it just a quick question of the, the private contractors? Like what are their incentives to do well? Like what they can make from come to be to be a private contractor are just like this fifty dollars subsidy and fundraising. Do they earn anything else, or they expect that if they are doing a good job this year, they're gonna get to do it again next year? Exactly. So I think it's a mix of of those. So let me tell you. So these are the contractors, and let me tell you a little bit about each one of them, and you know what might be their incentive. So. Uh, there are eight contractors, it's Rising Academy, YMCA, which is not the YMCA from the US, it's the Youth Movement for Collective Action in Liberia, but um, anyhow. Uh, the Street Child, uh, then there's Omega Schools, there's Stella Maris, there's Brack, there's More Than Me, and then there's Bridge International Academy. So out of these contractors, um, three of them are for profit. So um, Rising Academies, Omega schools and British International Academies are for profit. So they literally, you know, in their motives when they like founded the, the company, they, they wanted to earn money. How can they earn money on a $50 per student subsidy? 
unclear uh, in this point in time, but all these companies are kind of relying on like big scale. So they are the kind of companies that are doing these lesson plans, uh, written somewhere in Boston, and then shipped to these tablets in Liberia. And that only works if you can ship the same lesson plan to a thousand schools or something like that, because the fixed cost is kind of, is very high and then the marginal cost is very low. So their hope, if you ask me, is really, as you said, is like getting more schools in the future and eventually reaching a scale where they can work. Now, these are for-profit companies that are earning a lot of grants from say like the Bay Area crowd that believes in kind of these for-profit social enterprises. So they are giving them like a startup capital, kind of hoping that eventually they'll be able to make money and do like social good. Um, now, there are two Liberian companies that's Stella Maris and YMCA. I think the incentives for them are a little bit different. They actually do need to survive at least on the 50 dollar per student subsidy they are not for profit so they don't really make to need to make a profit but they need to you know at the very least kind of finance their cost um and then the other three which would be street child brack and more than me are not for profits but international so in their case it's a little bit the same is they don't want to make money and in some cases they are like look I'll even bring money from like my global, you know, headquarters or from like donors in Sweden or something like that to fund schools in Liberia on top of this $50 per student subsidy. Now, the contract, funnily enough, didn't have any like KPIs or they were very loosely defined. It was like improved learning gains, but it didn't have anything like, you know, children need to achieve X or you get fired or something like that. So in most cases, why are these contractors having an incentive to do well is a mix of intrinsic motivation, which I think is true for say like the BRACs of the world, which, you know, just kind of want to make the world better and it's pure intrinsic motivation. And a mix of like, if we do well, we're going to get more schools, which is true for the for-profit companies and to some extent to some of the non-profits. So I think it's a mix of the two, but the incentives are very, very loose, 100%. Um, great. Okay, so that's the brief introduction. Now let me tell you a little bit about the uh, evaluation design because it's an RCT, I mean, obviously this is an RCT uh, uh, seminar. It's going to be sort of straightforward except for one bit. So first, let me just tell you what data we collect. So we're going to collect data from schools. So we go to the schools, we send a numerator, it spends like half a day or like a full day with the principal and they collect data on how are the facilities looking? Uh, how do they spend whatever little money they have on their like school finances and some management practices? So we take questions from the World Management Survey and we ask, you know, to get a proxy of management quality. Then we have our own measures of like management quality, which includes anything from like literally just having like a school roster, you know, like a list of students with names and like phone numbers to which their parents or like where they live or, or like their age, just basic, basic information. And you wouldn't believe, but this is not very common in Liberia. Um, uh, so that kind of questions that we're, we're asking. Then we ask questions to teachers about social demographic uh, characteristics, their qualifications, experience, and all those tests. Uh, then we do classroom observations. So we, that essentially is an numerator sits through a whole class and records what's happening every two or three minutes. Uh, you know, is the teacher teaching? Is he spending time doing nothing? What are the students doing? That kind of stuff. Then we are going to do some interviews to students. That's going to be 20 students across all grades. Um, I'll tell you more about uh, the enrollment log in a second. And then we're going to do a gender-based violence survey. Uh, the reason that we included this survey is twofold. So one, Liberia has, uh, one of the worst uh, kind of rates for child abuse in the world. Uh, that's going to be a consequence of the civil war that happened there. There were a lot of child soldiers and a lot of problems kind of have perpetrated over time. Uh, and related to that, then two of these private companies were involved in sexual abuse scandals during uh, the evaluation. They were not in schools that they were managing through this private public partnership. They were on like schools that they were managing that were like purely private schools. But you know, you're worried if this is like a systematic problem in these companies that you should measure. So we're going to have something about social. Um, 
how data collection actually happened in reality. So uh, I think this is a good moment to take like a sidestep and tell you a little bit about Liberia. <laughs> so Liberia is, you know, every year, it depends a little bit on the year, top three to top four poorest country in the world. Let's just start with that. So, you know, think of like the poorest of the poorest in the world. Now, what is the history of the country? So back when the US was having a civil war, uh, neither the North nor the South knew what to do with the free slaves. Uh, even the people that were fighting for like no slavery didn't necessarily want the, these people to live in the US. So what they did is they went and bought a piece of land in Africa, which is Liberia, and then they ship a bunch of free slaves back to Africa. But these people were not from that region of Africa. They had never been to Africa before because these were like the children of people that had been brought to from Africa to the US, you know, one or two generations ago. And so they show up there and ironically, they kind of form a colonial society where the free slaves are on top and the local population that was already living there in that piece of land is becoming kind of like the colonized society. And over time, this created a lot of tensions and eventually this per what is known as the first and the second civil war in Liberia. If you ask me, it's just one big civil war with like a short peace period in the middle. Uh, and after that, the country just kind of like went, you know, uh, down and down and down the ladder of like income per capita and human development. Um, and the consequence is after in 2005, when the civil war ended, the country had like one of the worst GDPs in the world and like almost no infrastructure. So this right here is the road between the two main cities in the country. So this is how the road between the two main cities in the country looks like. And as you can tell, it's essentially impossible during the wet season. So this is just to give you a little bit of a sense of like what we're talking about here. And that's why the schools and like all the contracts here are very loose. It's just very hard to do, you know, anything formal here because like if you were going to write in the contract, like, you know, you need to do X and Y in the schools, the government doesn't even have the capacity to go and check that that's happening because the schools are all over the country and the country has roads like this. So it's very hard to do any real time monitoring. Um, okay, so that's background story. Now, on the actual experimental details, so, you know, we have a list of schools that we were given beforehand, and we're going to randomize them between treatment and control. That's the standard. And the treatment is some private contractor is going to come and manage the school. Now, before the treatment was announced, we went to the schools and we took the student enrollment rosters and we sampled some students from those enrollment rosters. And we are going to follow the students over time for three, well, almost four years, regardless of where they move in the country. So we look for them all over the country. If we had interviewed you at baseline before the treatment happened, we went and looked for you all over the country, no matter where you move. This is going to be very important because we were worried that these private contractors would have incentives, knowing that they were going to be evaluated by us, to cream skin and just kind of, you know, let the worst students go off their schools and figure out what to do and keep the best students for kind of themselves. And that way, if you do a comparison like three years later, even if you randomize, then the treatment schools are going to be artificially having better outcomes, but it's not because they were doing anything better, it's because they were selecting students. But as a whole, that's not really what we were after. So that's why we, are going to sample these students before the, the private companies ever went to the schools and they were going to follow them for three years. So everything is going to be an intent to treat analysis because some of these students, you know, naturally will have left schools for reasons that are unrelated to the treatment just because, you know, their parents moved somewhere else. And some of these uh, children are going to maybe leave the treatment halfway through the through the sample. Some of them are going to be there the whole time. Some of them will leave very early. So all sorts of reasons. So it's all going to be an ITT. Uh, that's very important. There's a part in the paper where we have, uh, you know, we do treatment and treated. We kind of instrument how many years they were actually enrolled in these treatment schools, 
with the treatment assignment and whatnot. The results are not going to be very different. So we're just going to focus on the ITT, which is like the cleanest experimental kind of result that we can have. Uh, does that make sense? Questions, anyone about that? All right. So if there are no more questions about uh, the experimental design, which is fairly simple, uh, then I'm just want, I just wanna go through the actual results. So first, let me tell you a little bit about learning, but before I show you the results, just put things into context one more time. So this is a, a figure taken from uh, the DHA surveys, uh, those demographic health surveys done by USAID in a bunch of countries. Um, and in those health surveys, they have a very simple measure of literacy where they have a card that usually says, the name uh, has a question that says, what is the capital city of whatever country they are in? And if people are able to read that question and answer it, so they understand what the, ca what the card says, then it's recorded as you know how to read. So it's a very simple literacy like benchmark. We're not talking about you being able to like read, you know, a complex newspaper article or anything like that. It's very simple. And then uh, that's what I'm going to have in the y-axis is literacy rate measured by the DHA survey. And on the x-axis is the highest grade attained. And then I'm going to compare a bunch of countries that have like comparable data from these DHA surveys. And you can see, you know, places like Burundi and Rwanda, by the time children kind of graduate from primary school, so the time they are in fifth grade, most of them know how to read, which is great. This is sort of like what primary school is about, right? Like knowing how to read and do your sums. Uh, there are places like in the middle, you know, somewhere like Mozambique or Haiti or Tanzania where, okay, it's not great, but there's like a positive gradient that, you know, like over half of the people by the time they have finished uh, primary school, they know how to. And then there's Liberia at the very bottom of this list, where by the time people finish primary school, less than 20% of them know how to read. So this is just to put into context how bad kind of like the education system is in Liberia and what the results are. So this is kind of like the base rate and this is what these private contractors are trying to improve. So first, let me tell you something very quickly about teacher practices. So like, you know, what actually changed in the schools that could have impact test scores and then we'll talk about test scores. So first of all, uh, these treatment schools, LEAP or partnership schools are more likely to be open and more and have more instruction time. So there are going to be a bunch of graphs like this. So let me just explain you how these graphs look like. So there's going to be one bar for the control, one bar for the treatment, each with a, a standard error. And kind of like, you know, if these uh, confidence intervals don't overlap, you can think that the difference is statistically significant. Obviously there's a covariance there that we need to worry about, but like, just like visually is, is almost the same. So, uh, the control is going to be the blue and the treatment is going to be the orange. And then, for example, if you look at the percent of schools that are in session during a surprise business. So what does this mean? We go, we send an enumerator during our regular school day. So, you know, a, reg a Wednesday at like 11 a.m. or something like that. Regular school day during school hours, they show up and they do a very simple check of whether the school is open or not. And, you know, in 80% of the cases, control schools are open which means roughly one out of five days in any given day, in any given week, control schools are closed. So just one day a week, schools in Liberia just don't seem to open for random reasons. Uh, the treatment, you know, improves things and goes up to 90%. It doesn't go all the way to 100%, but it's much better. And then they also, have longer uh, hours of instruction per week. So again, we have our numerator show up, they record kind of like the timetable, they make sure what time children get to the school, what time they leave, how many times they actually spend in class as opposed to research or something else. And that goes from about 20 hours per week in control schools to about 25 hours per week in treatment schools. So there's, so these schools are more likely to be open and have more hours of instruction per week. So children are essentially just getting more instruction. This goes further because we have a second check. And again, when the numerator shows up randomly on a random school day, a surprise visit, they record what is the teacher attendance. So we know every teacher that is supposed to work in the school because we have, you know, who's on the government payroll. And we check, you know, 
if Mauricio is in the government payroll for school A, is Mauricio actually on school campus? And if he's on school campus, even if he's drinking tea, we're going to say, okay, fine, he's out of work. Uh, so less than 50% of teachers in control schools are on school campus when they are supposed to be working. So half of the people are just off doing something else on a regular school day. That goes up a little bit in treatment schools, and this goes back to your question, T. So when we were looking at this same statistic, for example, in the first year, this was very difficult. But I think teachers after a while figure out, oh, they can still not fire me, even if I don't show up. And then it went down, and it's no longer statistically significant. Just, just to clarify, uh, Rocio, so this is the data after three years. All, all I'm going to show you, unless it's like very clearly labeled as first year, is data after three years. Okay, so, great. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I should have clarified that before. Okay, and then finally, we have this classroom observation. So once again, what we do is we send a numerator, sits through the entire class, and reports what's going on every two or three minutes. Um, and then you can roughly classify that into like three large groups. There's like more subgroups, but there's three large groups. One of them is off task. So is the teacher kind of looking at his phone, you know, drinking tea, talking to a colleague, just not doing anything remotely related to instruction. Uh, and in control schools, that's roughly 40% of the time. So 40% of the time, you know, four out of 10 minutes, the teacher is just not teaching. He's like looking at his phone, talking to a colleague, something else. That goes down in treatment schools to about 30%. So that should be ideally close to zero. It's not perfect, but there's a big improvement. And then that time that is not used being off task can be used roughly into big activities. So one of them is instruction. So actually, you know, teaching. And another one is classroom management. So, you know, kind of handing back uh, paperwork uh, or telling the children to be quiet or something along those lines. So both of those go up. So there's an improvement, again, just to remind you, uh, schools are more likely to be open. There's more instruction hours per week. And then while there's classes, there's actually more instruction happening during class time, which is great. But teachers are not more likely to show up. So, um, you know, some wins, some some lose. Okay, so that's kind of like what happens, you know, what is the actual changes in the school? Now let's look at test scores. So first I'll show you what are the results after one year. So this is what we had looked at first. After one year, we went and measured a bunch of things and we had seen that test scores had increased by about 0.18 standard deviations after one year. That's in English, math, we didn't see any change in abstract reasoning which is expected, you know, more changing that is much harder. And then a composite index of English and math also improved by roughly the same. amount. So great, there's some improvement in English and math after one year. So what happened after the three years? Originally, everyone expected this to keep going up, right? Like if there's these changes in like teacher behavior and like what's going on in the classroom and like how likely schools are open and that accumulates over time, you expect learning gains to improve. But they were disappointingly roughly the same. Uh, like the point estimates are literally not very different. <laughs> so uh, it just kind of flattened off. Like there was no difference between how many years you were treated. Like there were some, seemed like there were some easy gains after one year, but it's, it was hard for them to accumulate these gains over time. Uh, that's sort of like how we do it. Now, these point eighteen standard deviations, uh, if you have seen other education papers or I uh, usually read education papers, you'll see that this is like a usual standard effect size. I'll say like most papers have effect sizes that are between 0.1 and 0.3 standard deviations. So this is like roughly average, let's say, by, for an education intervention. But these, these are standard deviations of the control distribution. And if you recall the graph that I had showed you earlier, the control distribution is not very good. It's like, children don't really know how to read. So we're going to try to translate this kind of abstract metric of 0.18 standard deviations to something that, you know, the average policymaker can understand or that actually means something in real terms for children. And we do that by looking at how many words per minute children can read. So here uh, I'm showing you how, you know, the words per minute in first and fifth grade, the children that were originally in fifth and first and fifth grade, so three years later, so they should be in fourth and eighth grade, 
if they have advanced normally. Uh, how many words per minute they know how to read as time passes. So baseline is at the very beginning when we collect the first data, midline is after one year, and then end line is three years later. Um, so this is the share of students that can do like different things like zero words per minute, different ranges. Uh, and on the, on the right, we have the, the means. So you can see the control mean is roughly the same, for example, in first grade at baseline. And then the treatment, uh, the treatment mean goes up a little bit and goes up more than the control. Mean. So that's the treatment effect. And the treatment effect is roughly three words per minute. So children are going from reading about 10 words per minute after three years to about 13 words per minute. This is very low. You roughly need to read about 65 words per minute to be considered fluent in English, at least. Um, and children in first grade are just, that were in first grade originally and then in fourth grade uh, a few years later, know how to read three more words per minute. But in absolute terms, that's nothing. That's very far away from the benchmark of actually knowing how to read. And then the children that were in fifth grade originally and will have been in eighth grade three years later, they can read, you know, it goes up from about 25 to about 27 words per minute or 28. So again, it's three words per minute. It's not huge and it's very far from the benchmark. So these point entry standard deviations in this particular case are just not that great in absolute terms. It's unlikely, put in, in a different way, that these treatment gains are going to dramatically alter these children's life. Uh, I mean, I might be wrong. We might do an ev impact evaluation 10 years from now, and I might be telling you that this is the best program in the universe, but at least at face value right now, it just doesn't look like this is going to have a huge impact on children's life. Um, fine, so that's the test course. And then we have these eight private companies, so we can look what are the learning gains, you know, are the difference between these eight private contractors. And what we see is that there are big differences. There are essentially a group of five providers that achieve some decent learning gains. Uh, that's Street Child, Bridge, YMCA, More Than Me, and Rising. Those are learning gains of about 0.4 standard deviations. And then there are three contractors, that's Damaris, Omega, and BRAC, that achieve learning gains that are essentially zero. Now, something important, going back to what are the incentives of these companies, is that there's not a lot of difference depending on the characteristics of the providers. So there are three private providers. Remember those are Rising, Omega, and Bridge International Academies. So two of them have large learning gains and one of them has very disappointing results. If you kind of split them by, are they Liberian or are they foreigner? So the Liberian institutions are YMCA and Stella Maris. Stella, YMCA has good results. Stella Maris has very disappointing results. So that doesn't seem to be very different. If you split them by, do they use technology heavily in their classrooms? That'll be Rising, Bridge, uh, Omega, a little bit of Brack. Again, there doesn't seem to be a lot of patterns. So at least at face value, I mean, obviously these are regressions with eight data points. There doesn't seem to be a systematic kind of pattern between the characteristics of these providers and the results that you see in practice. So my takeaway from this is, is very hard for uh, governments, you know, the public sector to select who are going to be good partners for public private partnerships, exactly. You kind of need to experiment with them and then eventually they don't work well, kind of cut down their contracts and then just expand whoever's working well. So, um, um, Mauricio, yeah. sorry. Um, so looking at the data that you collect, uh, I mean, just to ask for motivation. So I guess you, the, the original plans must be like, you want to understand which which characteristic that drive this, right? Because you ask, you, you collect a lot of, I mean, yeah. function, like how many books, technology, you do observe classroom or not, but I guess it's disappointing in like many other studies, including my own. Mm -hmm. People ask what the key indicator, the honest answer would be no idea. No idea. You're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, exactly. So we collected all this data and I don't have the graph here, so I'm sorry, but we even kind of, for all these other outcomes that we have, so the way that the experiment worked is we had a pairwise randomization. So each treatment school has its own control school. So we can look at the at the like pair level, what are the differences? 
and we can see, okay, so we can ask the question, are schools that have got more teachers to show up, the schools that are doing the better, right? Like, is there a positive correlation between the treatment effect on teacher attendance and test scores? And we do that for a bunch of statistics. And I mean, we see some correlations uh, there that nothing like household there, but they are not like really strong. And if you look at kind of the figures, like the scatter plots, they look really kind of like all over the place. And even the contractors don't have like very systematic things on all these other margins. So like, for example, Rising will have like a school where all teachers are showing up now. So like teacher attendance, the treatment effect is very large, but then on some other school, there's no effect on teacher attendance. Uh, do you know what I mean? Like, it just seems like the management practices are also not very uniform across the schools. So it's very hard to draw any systematic patterns out of this, uh, which again, yeah, it was very disappointing. We spent all this money collecting this data and it was like, mm. <laughs> um, all right, so that's learning. So treatment effects on learning. Now, uh, we also had to ask the question whether these private contractors had an effect on access. Were they actually making it more likely that children show up to school? There's a reason why this is important. So again, going back to context. So this is the representative data from, from uh, the National Health and Family Survey. Uh, and this is showing the proportion of children in different age groups enrolled in different types of schools. So for example, you know, just looking at like the bar for eight-year-olds, that's saying that about 60% of them are enrolled in early childhood education, that's orange. Then, you know, about 20% of them are enrolled in primary school and about 20% of them, that's the missing up to 100, are just not enrolled in any school. So this is showing both how many children are not enrolled in school and how many children are enrolled in different types of school. So a few things to note out of this graph. First, while most of the world has kind of nearly achieved universal education at the primary level, uh, most of the world. Uh, that's not the case in Liberia. Over 20% of children, you know, that are in primary age groups, so like from, uh, you know, five to 12 are not in school. And also very importantly, you will see the huge share of students that are well above kindergarten age that are in early childhood education. So, you know, again, going to like the eight-year-old, about 60% of them are in what, I don't know how that'll be called in Thailand, but like in what it goes before first grade. So like kindergarten, nursery, uh, I don't know what other words are, are out there to call this, but it's like whatever happens before formal primary education starts. That's huge. Um, and again, this is a consequence of the civil war because there were all these child soldiers that were fighting during the civil war. There were, as soon as the civil war ended, they had been out of school for a very long time. And then they tried to enter the schooling system, but they were too old uh, or they were older and they had no formal education. So they had to start from like early childhood education up. And that has created like a backlog across generations uh, that you still see today. So improving access is as important as improving learning outcomes in the case of Liberia. In other countries of the world, this has been fixed, but that's not the case. So, okay. After three years, we go and look for students and we ask them whether they are still in the same school and whether they're still in any school. Any school that can be, if they go from primary to secondary school, are they still in secondary school? So whether they're in the same school, that's roughly 40%, regardless of treatment and control. So there's no treatment effect there. That's not very surprising, uh, the, the low number, the 40%, as, you know, these three years later, like children move, they have moved to different schools, they have, some of them have graduated from primary school and gone to secondary school. There's just a lot of change. But then whether they are still in any school, these are all still like uh, school-age children, that goes down between the treatment and the control. So what's the backstory here? Why is this happening? Because this, uh, at least to me, it was sort of a surprising result. After we look into this more and more, we first look at which were the providers that were driving this. So if you look at the treatment effect on whether children are still in school, three years later by provider, you see that a bunch of the providers have zero treatment effect, that's essentially Brax, Street, Child Stella, YMCA, and Bison. But three providers have a negative effect, and two of them have a larger effect, Bridge and Omega. So what happened here is that 
In Liberia, as in many countries in the world, sometimes primary schools will have an integrated secondary school in them, right? So there'll, there'll be a primary school that goes from usually first to sixth grade or something like that. And then there's a secondary school that goes from seventh to ninth grade. But instead of being located somewhere else, it's just located in the same school. And sometimes it's managed by the same principal and they kind of share teachers and resources. That varies a little bit country by country. So in Liberia, this was the case. The public partner partnership was intended for primary school. But, you know, sometimes when providers were assigned one of these locations, they were given a school that had a secondary school integrated in them. Now, Liberia is a country where you know, it's understaffed, like the schools tend to be understaffed, like there's not enough teachers for every grade. But, I mean, the usual problems that happen in poor countries. So what some of these providers did was that they shut down the secondary school that was in the same premises as the primary school. That way they could use the teachers from that second, that were teaching secondary grades for primary school and improve the resources for the, school, for the grades that they were getting paid for essentially. And then the children, that were in those secondary schools had to go and find another school to attend. And what we find is that that was mainly the case for Bridge Omega, who were given some of these schools and shut down those grades. This happened like all the providers were given these type of schools, but it was just those, those two that chose to shut down the secondary grades. So this essentially meant that a bunch of children had to look for a different school shortly thereafter. And three years later, they are less likely to be involved in secondary school as they transition to these grades later on. Uh, so there's a negative treatment effect on access, uh, which is obviously not great. Now, then we ask about sustainability. So, you know, is this program sustainable? Like in the long term, is this something that the government can afford? So here we are just going to look at how much money are these providers spending per child. And this can be separated between what are going, we're going to call variable costs. So, you know, it is something that increases proportional to the number of students, maybe linearly, and a fixed cost, something that, you know, you can have twice as many students, twice as many schools, and it wouldn't change. And uh, remember that these providers were giving $50 per student. So there's some providers, Street Child, Omega, YMCA, BRAC, that roughly stay within the $50 that they were giving to them. Then there's Rising, who started with this really high cost, but it, it gain experience in the country, it will manage to lower the cost to $70 per student. So like very close to the government benchmark. Then there's more than me who was just spending $250 per student throughout the whole time. And then there's Bridge who started spending over $600 per student, then 200 and then 130. So some of these contractors are actually going to be sustainable in the long term for Liberia, but some of them are not. And also, when thinking about the treatment effects, think that, you know, someone like Bridge was spending over four times as much as the public sector was spending. So whatever effects you're seeing in learning is a mix of, you know, they are doing something different in management, but they also just have a ton of more resources. But the same is true for more than me, who's spending over five times what the government is spending in the schools. Uh, and then, you know, eventually all the other providers are spending a little bit more than than public schools so in like someone like Rising, but not a lot more. So this is also something important to take into account. So some of these providers, you know, unless people in donors and people in uh, Silicon Valley and elsewhere keep funding them forever and ever, they're just not a sustainable solution for Liberia because the government cannot spend or not pay them as much as they're spending in their schools. Um, and then finally, safety. So, we're going to look at two aspects of safety. One of them is corporal punishment, which is banning ban in Liberia, and the near one is sexual violence. So corporal punishment, we just ask students directly, you know, have you ever been hit by your teacher? Yes or no? Uh, so in the control group, about 50% say they have never been hit by a teacher. Depending on the country, this sometimes is shocking because, you know, half of the teacher, the students are saying that they have been hit by the teacher. Uh, like this, for example, used to be very common in Colombia, where I'm from, in the generation of my parents. But like, if you were to show this number to say my friends who have kids in schools in Colombia, they'll be shocked. They'll be like, no way. The half of the people are, uh, the children are being hit by teachers. This is just not okay by the social norms of the country right now. 
Now, this rate is a little bit higher, meaning less corporal punishment in treatment schools, but it's not like it's going all the way to 100%. So a lot of these providers are international. They have international standards. They are US companies or UK companies or from Sweden, and they are bound by the laws of those, uh, of those countries. And it's not like corporate punishment goes down to zero. So it's less common, but it is not bound by international standards. Right? And then we ask about sexual abuse, violence. Uh, this is in collaboration with Laura Johnson at the Rogers School of Social Work, who helped us design the survey to ask about gender violence. And Wayne Sandholz, uh, who used to be a, a grad student at U San Diego and now is uh, in uh, Nova School in Lisbon. I should have updated his uh, affiliation, my bad. So again, the background is that uh, there are widespread reports of sexual violence in schools in Liberia. So there's a sample from 2018 where they interview over 800 girls and about 36% of them claim that they had been uh, sexually abused by someone in their school recently. Um, if you look at the form of abuse, in many cases is, uh, is sexual violation, so rape. Uh, in many cases, it's transactional sex that's usually known as sex for grades. So essentially, the teachers will pass the, pass, uh, the subject if in exchange uh, they're giving sex. And again, there was an incident with two of the providers, more than me and YMCA. These incidents were not in schools managed through the partnership, but you know, you worry that there are systematic problems. So there was essentially no impact on sexual abuse cases. Uh, we asked about three types of sexual abuse, mainly first, whether uh, they have been improperly touched in their private parts without uh, their permission. Then whether they have been, uh, whether they have had sex with teachers. Uh, since all these are minors, this is statutory rape but we asked them if it's consensual. And then we asked them if there's forced sex, uh, if the sex was forced, so if it's a pure rape. Uh, so, you know, over around 8% of children claim that have been touched inappropriately by their teacher. Uh, about 4% of them claim that have, they had sex with their teacher. And about 3% of them claim that they have been um, sexually abused by a teacher. And there's no difference between treatment and control. Now, it doesn't, you know, there's no increase, so there's like no positive or negative treatment effect, but I see this personally as a failure of the program. Again, these were a bunch of private contractors. Most of them were international. They are bound by international law uh, or like the law of whatever country they were founded in. And they have standards that are very similar or they have like company standards that are bound by the social norms in their home countries where sexual abuse is, you know, zero tolerance. And still, you know, 4% of children are claiming that they have been, had sex with a teacher recently. Um, that's not good. And I always ask parents, well, you know, would you rather send your ch children to a school that, you know, the, the child is going to learn how to read two more words per minute in a given year or where the sexual abuse rate by teachers is lowered by two percentage points or something like that. And I feel like I'll rather send my child where I know it's not going to be abused by a teacher. So, um, I see this as a big failure of the program personally, but you know, the results are the results and everyone can check them as they want. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to end a little bit early, which I think is fine. We can have discussion if you guys want. Um, so just to conclude, you know, this is the big summary of the results. So this is everything that I had shown you before, just kind of put into one big graph. So these are the eight private contractors. This is their treatment effect on learning, the treatment effect on access, so you know, whether children are still in school two years later, the treatment effect on safety, so whether there's uh, the impact on sexual abuse incidents, and then their cost per pupil uh, in US terms. Um, so, you know, you can see that, again, there are some contractors that have a positive result on learning, but these are not the same contractors that have a positive effect on access, for example. Nor are they necessarily the same contractors that have a positive treatment effect on safety, sexual abuse. So for example, BRAC is not doing really great in terms of learning, but they are the only ones that are able to lower the, the incidence of sexual abuse in their schools. Uh, or someone 
like Bridge is doing really well in learning, but not so well in terms of access. Uh, they're low in the probability that different children are going to their schools. And again, sustainability is one concern for some of these contractors are just spending a lot of money. So there are multiple dimensions that we try to focus on. And I just going back to the point, there just also doesn't seem to be a lot of correlation in who's doing well in different metrics. So from the point of view of a contract of the government, there seems to be some trade-offs in which contractors you want to select based on how you weight these different metrics. Um, so just to summarize these results, learning gains remain significant, but have flattened after one year. So learning gains are roughly the same three years or one year later. Um, looking beyond learning outcomes, corporal punishment goes down a little bit, but sexual abuse pockets have not been redu reduced by the program. And then dropout rates, so children that are no longer in school three years later are up, so access has gone down. Um, and then beyond the average, some operators um, are doing really well in most metrics. Some operators present trade-offs, meaning they do really well in one of these metrics, not so great in the others. And, you know, the government needs to decide who they're going to select based on this. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to end 20 minutes earlier, but I think this is, you know, we can open it up for discussion if there's appetite for that. Good, thank you. Thank you. Um, if there's any question, please feel free to raise your hand or if you have a question in Thai, you can type in the chat and I can translate. Uh, okay, so let me start. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, it's more like political economy, I guess, for my question. Yeah. So, <laughs> so how is the response of these, I mean, uh, organizations, right? I mean, when they see the report, I mean. <laughs> um, not very good. <laughs> so, well, I mean, I think I'm mixed, a mixed bag. Uh, so again, going back to this. So like, for example, there's um, like someone like Street Child, did fairly well in most metrics, and they were very happy to see the results. Um, and they didn't care too much, to be honest. They were like, oh, we did great. Like, you know, pat in the back, continue doing our work. Uh, which I thought was interesting because they could have gone, used this to go to donors and be like, look, you're really good, like give us money. But they didn't seem to care too much. Now, there were operators, especially the for-profit, so someone like Bridge, who, you know, this report could potentially damage the reputation or improve them. So the stakes were much higher. Um, I mean, there was a lot of animosity online. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, you can go back and like dig the Twitter fights that we had with them, but they were calling us liars and that we were, uh, you know, dishonest for <laughs> doing this RCT <laughs> this way because we, you know, they were never told that we were going to look at access and other things, and there was animosity. Um, in the end, I think they, you know, Justin and I are like two academics sitting in our offices with like no PR offices, so like it's us tweeting. They have like a PR machine because some of these companies are like multi-million dollar companies. And I think in the end, they were able to spin the results favorably, no matter what, so. <laughs> Okay, well, I mean, um, so, so also an, another practical uh, question is like, I mean, for me, we don't need and we should not tell them everything we're going to measure, right? I mean, I don't know if it's a, No, I agree, I agree. I mean, as a um, scientist. That, that was the whole point. I mean, so as we told them, like the whole point why we went and like took the students before you had any chance to like mess with the involvement rosters and all that is... Because if I tell you I'm going to measure A, you will like focus on A. I am, you know, roughly going to tell you I'm going to measure the impact of this, right? And, you know, broad welfare of children, you know, broadly understood. And uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a good lesson. It, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, but this, this was a complicated evaluation. Um, and you're right about asking about the political economy because some of these companies, again, they are, I mean, I don't know if multi-million dollar company is the right way, but they have received millions of dollars in grants, like some of them. They are large grant donor recipients. And like, 
you know, there's a report saying, oh, look, this other company who's spending half of your money is doing much better. You can imagine some of the donors kind of steering away from where they're funding. Some of the donors might actually double down and say, no, I actually believe in you guys. And, and that is some of the Twitter files that we had online were actually with the donors of some of the companies that wanted to defend them. Um, and I don't know, I've never been in anything that was so contentious, to be honest. Uh, there were three years that were very stressful in my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would be wondering, I mean, that there's no someone or some academics or some people in the government or in the, uh, uh, the international bank that tell you guys that, hey, don't publish the name of the organization. So there was a lot of contentious about this for a little while, but here was the deal. Um, we were thinking of publishing this with like operator one, operator two, operator three, mm -hmm. just like blank names. Um, but each operator had a number of schools that was different from each other. So like one operator had 30, another had 25, another had 23. So if you're anyone who knows the program, who is the people that will care about this, can figure out who's who by looking at the size of the standard errors, essentially, because they are proportional to the number of schools. So you can figure out, oh, the one with the tiny standard error must be breached because it's the one with the most schools. And then the next one must be, and so on. So we actually discussed this with the uh, IRB board uh, for a long time, and they agreed that it was fine to release. I mean, there's a pub they were like, these are public companies. This is public information. They're participating in a public program. Like, this is not private information from like an individual or something like that. So, uh, yeah. Well, I salute you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll say that one of these companies called Michael Kramer, who was the advisor of my advisor, to have my advisor call me to tell me that, you know, to, uh, you know, try to put pressure on like results being spin different ways. Um, so they have influence. But in the end, I mean, I should say also, by the way, Michael Kramer and my advisor both said, publish the science, you know, you're doing an RCT, treatment versus <laughs> control. There's not like that much, you know, like, what are you going to do here? Like, it's an RCT. <laughs> so, yeah, kudos to them. <laughs> uh, hello, hi, I have maybe three questions. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's very, very interesting paper. And as we discussed before, I think it's very, like a, in terms of political economy or in terms of maybe like a, the policy is very interesting. So I, I want to have, my, my first question is like a, uh, from your finding, it seems that different operators uh, maybe perform differently. Uh, I wonder like a, whether this results or whether there is any official evaluator of the program, maybe by different evaluate evaluator. From my understanding, I think like uh, your 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 research is more like a, it's not the official evaluation of this program. No, no, I, I was the official evaluation of the program. So I, again, just uh, before before your next question, just to give you a little bit of a uh, because this is going to be a long answer. <laughs> so. The, the story behind the evaluation is the following. So one of the companies, I won't disclose the name of that one, convinced the government of outsourcing all of its primary schools to them, creating a, essentially creating a private monopoly of the education system. Uh, when the UN and the World Bank heard about this, they were like, they, you know, they, they put the, the cry in the sky. They were like, you cannot do this. So they like called the Ministry of Education. They were like, hold the plan and you know the negotiations between them were like the, the ministry said look i don't have the money to run schools and these people are going to bring money like so it was like okay fine mm -hmm. let's try it out as a pilot so we'll bring more contractors have like an open bid some people will bid for different schools and have an evaluation so i'm part i'm the evaluation that came mm -hmm. with that negotiation um i mean it was an independent evaluation, but it was like the official evaluation. I see. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, I'm, okay. So, from the paper, it, it seems that, I mean, regardless of the results, the government or the, the donor 
still like a fund this program anyway, right? For the air provider, I mean, I I, I want to know like in practice, uh, do they have the plan to maybe change the provider or to terminate some or to have terms limit of some maybe yeah. underperforming even uh, provider? Um, what happened in practice uh, was the following. So. The evaluation happened, we presented the results. We said, look, these guys are performing well, these are not like, you know, here's, you know, kind of like this figure to the government. Um, and someone who was funding the whole project was funding it because one of the private companies was there. Mm -hmm. So they said, and it was one of the private companies that was not doing so well. So they said, if you take that company out, I'll take the funding for the whole program away. Oh. So they kind of held the government hostage in a sense <laughs> to, the, to the funding. Uh, and then they go, so the government expanded the program. Mm. So in, 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 these schools are still being treated. It expanded the program. So there are like, I think up to this point, 150 more treatment schools that are not part of the RCT. Uh, and it expanded it not along the lines of who's doing better in these metrics, more along the lines of who is able to provide more funding for the country. Mm. I see. Yeah. <laughs> Very yeah. <interesting. laughs> yeah. I, I can go back to the political economy of this program. Mm. <laughs> you can I imagine that, um, you know, you want, you want private donors to fund education system in, in Liberia. That should be their goal. Like, you know, if they want to do some good. But they are choosing ex ante who are the winners, who are the companies that they want to back. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is leading to all sorts of like weirdness. Okay. Okay, yeah. thank you. Maybe to maybe to, to detail question. So I, I wonder about the access. So why there are a lot of like a, uh, less in terms of access after this uh, provider coming in? And another question is, uh, in terms of teacher incentive. So uh, what do they have to do with, if, if they find that the teacher have uh, maybe underperformed because most of the teacher are government teacher are still under payroll of the government, right? So whether those uh, provider uh, maybe can move the teacher to different school or how, what, what, what is the incentive to bring high performance teacher to, uh, to, to the school? that they uh, look after, yeah, it's my no. uh, Let me start backwards with the second question. So the, as, as we were talking about, like there's not a lot of incentives for teachers. Teachers figure out after a while that they cannot get fired. Now, the providers, and I, I mean, it's just, I, I thought that this was going to take longer, but the providers do have an incentive to try to change which teachers are in their schools. So teachers cannot be fired, but they can be reshuffled across the system. And indeed, that's what they were able to do. So we, they were actually, essentially, they went and looked for the best teachers in nearby schools and lobbied the government to shuffle teachers around so they got the best teachers and kind of send the teachers that were not so good in their schools to other public schools. So that kind of make nearby public schools worse and they make mm. their schools better. If you think, I mean, and this is measured on, in terms of like, we did a, a test to teachers in terms of teacher knowledge. So teacher knowledge is higher in treatment schools uh, and it's lower in, in control schools. And this is all due to this reshuffle. So the, pro the, the teachers don't really have an incentive to do much different, but the providers have an incentive to do the reshuffling mm -hmm. and they are doing it indeed. And that's part of the sustainability point in the paper. I mean, uh, the presentation is not because this is making the providers better, but it's not making the education system better. It's just reshuffling the resources across the and control schools, so it's not uh, much better. Um, now, uh, the other question was about the access, right? Yeah, yes. so all the access, Absolutely. we later go and split this by reason why people uh, leave school, and it seems to be driven by two things. So one of them is pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So in Liberia, if, if a girl is pregnant, theoretically, she's not allowed to go to school uh, until she has the baby. I'm not saying, I don't know if this is good or bad, but that's just a lot. And 
we don't think that the program is causing more girls to be pregnant, but maybe the providers are kind of sticking more to the to the letter of the law and keeping some of these girls out. This is we are not 100 percent sure, but we're just seeing that when we ask children, why are you not longer in school? A lot of them are saying it's because I'm pregnant. Well, all the, a lot of girls are saying that. So that's just like one reason that we are thinking of. And then the other one is it just is children are transitioning from primary to secondary school. So it just seems that that transition is much less successful in the treatment schools. And I think this has to do with the fact that they shut down these kind of secondary schools in the places that had primary and secondary schools in the same building. Okay. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, just a quick question based on the access that you say that because some of the students drop out, but for, for the test score, are you still follow to test those students who drop out from school? Yes, yes, exactly. So so these learning gains or these treatment effects is a mix of like some students were in the treatment school for three years, some of them were for two years and then dropped out. Some of them were in a treatment school and then changed to a control school. Um, and this whole ITT. In the paper we have, you know, we instrument how many years they were in the treatment schools by, uh, and the results are slightly different, but not like super different. And it's just so complicated to explain that instrument that we just prefer to present the IDT results. Okay, so so, so you said that the, 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 what we see that year one and year three are the same. Year three also include some children who already drop out, exactly. but even though yeah. you exclude them, the results are not much different. The results are not very different, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Thank it's you. not like you see, you know, this big jump. Uh, yeah, so it's not driven by kind of children going going out. The flatness of the of the the learning games. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Just a little bit of a follow-up question. Um, so yeah. I think um, you were saying basically like the provider can shuffle the teachers around. So what we're seeing is probably like um, the effect from, you know, having better teacher at school. Um, and I guess like do, wondering if the providers also have influence on like what school they are at side too in the beginning because you said there is like some lobbying from, from some providers and yeah. can they be a, Those are both excellent questions. So in terms of what school they are assigned to, so they there was some lobbying in what type of schools. So some of the providers essentially said uh, because they use technology to deliver these lessons plans to tablets, they needed to have 3G connections, like we within the area of like a 3G antenna. And that limited which schools they were, could be assigned. So the way that our organization originally happened is we first kind of stratify by which schools could go to which provider and then we randomize treatment and control. So they could have an influence on what type of school they were randomized into, but not which particular school they got into. And this, the schools are different across providers. So this is going to make the comparison across providers not 100% kosher, right? Because they're essentially, you can think of this as like eight experiment, one per provider, and they are not necessarily like comparable among them. Now, we spent a lot of time in the paper doing like uh, adjustment by covariates and basic hierarchical analysis to try to make them comparable. And the results, again, are so similar that I'm just presenting the raw differences, but, you know, they look very similar if you do very fancy econometric adjustments, let's just call it like that. So, um, yeah. Now, on the, on, the, on the teachers, so they couldn't, exactly, so they couldn't select where the teachers got reshuffled, but they could lobby the government to have teachers reshuffled. And we saw that happen. They literally went to the government and said, look, this teacher is not very good. I need to change. And because of the, the government could have fired them, they just assign a new teacher and how do you want to do it? Um, and indeed, so the treatment effect is going to be a combination of like what we call extra resources, the resources understood as like the extra money plus, you know, different, better teachers and the changes in management. Um, we also tried to do like a decomposition of the learning treatment effect. Like, you know, how much was coming from like extra resources, how much was coming from extra management. And 
you know, and, and this obviously is not experimental. So, you know, take it with a pinch of salt, but it was like half and half. So like half of the treatment effects seem to be coming from better management and half of it seemed to be coming from more resources understood as like more features, better teachers and more money. Um, and just a little bit on the cost, because you show like there are some fixed costs and variable costs. Um, yeah. But yeah, and also like you said, the teacher actually get paid the same for all the providers. So they just earn like government salary. Um, That's right. I guess like, yeah, what's are the costs? Um, I guess expenditure going to mostly. Yeah, so so imagine, I think the, the easiest to explain is someone like Bridge. So Bridge is the one that has their model is they provide a tablet to each teacher where the, where the lesson plan is uploaded every day. And the lesson plan is designed by a bunch of education experts in Boston. So the fixed cost is sort of like designing these education plans, right? Like this lesson is very detailed, but for every class, every day, for the whole school year, for every grade and every subject. So that takes, you know, a lot of manpower and that is fixed because once you design one of those lessons plans, you can just, and that's why the, less, the fixed cost drops dramatically after the, the first year. Um, and, you know, it depends on, on the provider, which one are these fixed costs, but it's roughly that. Um, and the variable cost, so for example, Bridge insisted in having uniforms for the children. So they, are giving each child in their schools a uniform. Uh, and obviously that's very viable. And textbooks, so that's viable cost. Textbooks, the government of Liberia provides textbooks on a regular basis, meaning in practice, they, have, they haven't provided textbooks in many years. Uh, so Bridge goes and provides their own textbooks that they are publishing, uh, and that's all viable cost. So it's things like that that go into the viable cost. That also includes kind of like the president motorcycle that goes around each of the schools, kind of supervising what's going on in the schools um, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Thank you. And we, I think we have a few more minutes. Uh, if anyone has more questions. Ah, so if they if they ask you a question, uh, so I want to ask your opinion. Like, uh, uh, if there's like a situation like this in maybe in other country or like uh, in terms of public private partnership, uh, what would the policy recommendation that you would uh, maybe advise to maybe government that maybe want to have this kind of program? Um, look, I walk into this program being. Uh, your typical economist thinking that this was going to be great. Uh, like, you know, the private sector is has better incentives. So, you know, yes, uh, there might be some multitasking and contracting issues, but in education that those shouldn't be too big. That was my thinking, walking into the project. And I walk out of the project thinking, look, if a government is not able to provide education directly, or whatever service we're talking about, you you have like there has to be a very specific set of reasons why you think that the, that same government is going to be able to manage the private contractors that are going to provide that service under the public partnership better than is able to provide the service directly, right? Like you're doing the the public private partnership because there's a government failure. The government is not able to provide the service directly, so you outsource it. But it has to be a very kind of specific government failure for you to think that you're going to be able to manage the private contractor better than you're able to provide the service directly. So, like, I just think that those, like, there might be instances where this is true, but in general, I don't think this is true. <laughs> like, I think if, if you're not able to, to provide the service directly, like, why would you think that you're going to be able to manage the private contract? Um, that's my general thinking these days. So like maybe there are cases in you know, specific industries, in specific countries, 
uh, and whatnot. But I think in general, I don't know. <laughs> I'm 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 skeptical. <laughs> I mean, just just for discussion. I mean, compared to uh, Katrick uh, the voucher in India, right? I mean, of course, there are two things. I mean, voucher is more like a free. I mean, there's a lot of choices that parent can make, and here there's a restriction about. I mean, choosing teacher and principal. That's still, exactly. I mean, for me, it's still a big question mark. But on the other hand, though, I mean, that is also difficult is maybe the level of development of India and Liberia. I mean, even though India has a lot of rural, but still, I mean, it's not like the uh, Liberia, which we don't know if we can apply the, uh, I don't know, I guess, it's dev therefore, it's not obvious if we can apply that voucher in India into Liberia, I guess. Isn't it? You're absolutely right. Yeah. Like I think, for example, like for a voucher to work, you need like a healthy competition in the mm -hmm. private sector, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're giving parents money, but they cannot really spend it in a market, right? right. Uh, the whole idea of giving the market is of the voucher is to give them money, they spend it in the market, and you know, market does its magic and things are great. Um, but you need a healthy market for that to happen. And I just don't think like Nigeria would have that setting. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I might be wrong, but that's just my impression right now. Um, but I mean, in general, like vouchers and, and public partnerships, like charter schools, I mean, they are different for a variety of reasons, but like you can design a public private partnership that resembles a voucher and vice versa. If you put enough kind of, you know, kind of legal structure around it, in practice, they can be the same. But I think, the, the main difference is when you have a voucher, usually if you leave the school, the money follows you. So you kind of have some leverage over the private school. Mm -hmm. While with the voucher, oh, sorry, with the charter, that's not true. If you leave the school, then the school is still going to earn some money from the government um, and the money is not going to follow you necessarily. So um, I think that's one of the big differences. Um, yeah. Maybe that's why I'm looking forward to reading your new paper. <laughs> yeah, Maybe I'll the, send it along with, shortly. <laughs> yeah, with, with a discussion, I mean, relative, I mean, compared to Katrick's paper would be nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that these public part partnerships um, in, a, in a sector like education, again, like, I think my, my thinking example, being from Latin America, where these vouchers are very popular, like Chile is very famous for having a lot of vouchers. Um, was like, oh, I mean, this seems like, you know, I, like it would work, like competition, blah, blah. Um, and I'm now like, I, I, as you said, I think you need like a certain level of development. Um, and development meaning both the country, but like development within the education, like the market for a voucher and like something like a public partnership to work. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, if we don't have any more questions, um, I would like to um, end the presentation today. Um, thank you, Professor Mauricio Romero so much for um, presenting and showing your work on the Liberia's private um, public partnership. Um, and um, yeah, we look forward to reading your next paper. Um, thank you for sharing a lot of insights on this like research and you know, a lot of like results that might not always be like what we hope for. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> and thank you for inviting me. Uh, this was a lot of fun. It's always good to talk about like the nitty gritties and the background of the paper uh, because um, yeah, it's hard to see those in like the statistics. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, well, everyone. Thank you. I hope very to see nice you all in Bangkok soon. <laughs> nice. I, I couldn't hear you. I'm just saying that I hope to see you all in Bangkok soon. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.